All right, everybody, this is the unit one lecture for environmental approaches. And what we're going to be doing is looking at four different ways to think about, you know, how people either use or um, approach to have, you know, just have feelings or um, what they think, th how the, the environment should be used. Now, there's preservation then, conservation, sustainable development, and development. Um, and so let's start thinking about environmental presentation, pre preservation. So, um, you know, I think most people that are in this kind of thinking that in the environment should be preserved think that nature has an intrinsic value. And I'll say from my own personal viewpoint, yes, I do believe nature has a deep intrinsic value. Uh, not just to other humans or other organisms, but definitely to me. Um, you know, I really like to do a lot of different things out in nature. Um, I think, you know, if you think about a nice, you know, this is um, Devil's Tower National Monument out in Wyoming. Um, you know, there's, there's something beautiful about this in comparison to this dirty city and looks like New York City. But, um, you know, I... There, I wouldn't say I personally have a spiritual connection to nature, but um, you know, I generally I do realize the aesthetic nature, the beauty that um, nature has for me. And I, for recreation, it's a good portion of what I do for recreation. So you know, I I certainly believe that nature deserves to be protected. Um, I'll think about that in, in a little different way um, when we talk about conservation but I'll yeah I'll, I'll just let you wait for that so the thing about the you know environmental preservation is I think it's it's necessary to think about nature in this way when we're talking about either certain areas or certain um, interactions that organisms have with humans. I mean, polar bears, right? They Polar bears and humans just don't mix, and we are going to lose that battle every single time. So, you know, if we want to have polar bears around, we basically have to preserve their habitat and not have any humans there. Um, there's plenty of examples. Here's a, a research paper that came out in 2011 looking at human activity differentially re redistributes large mammals in the Canadian Rockies National Parks. So what does that mean? Basically, when humans come around, it moves large mammals. So it's moving um, elk, bison, uh, moose. They kind of flee away from where humans are. So um, there's definitely like some places that we need to preserve. I think that is true. Um, but when we look more, you know, at a conservation kind of um, approach to the environment, that's a little bit different, where it's somewhat a balance between complete, complete preservation and complete development, right? I don't think a forest should be a parking lot, should be made into a parking lot. I don't necessarily think a forest should people never go there like so the national forests in northern Wisconsin northern Minnesota out west um, I think those national forests are great places to be but I think we should also be able to use them we should be using them wisely but um, I think it's you know important to be ha that there be some sort of balance so national forests if you know anything about how their land is managed um, logging companies can come in and selectively harvest to take out some of the trees. Uh, people can go hunting on them. Um, you can go fishing in national forests. So it's definitely not a complete preservation thing. Now there are limits and the, um, the Forest Service um, tries to keep track of those, um, the uses that go on in their national forest. Um, but I think it's, you know, this is at least where I lie in, you know, my personal beliefs. Um, where we should be using these resources, but we should be using them wisely. I think a great example of this is, um, you know, that 
um, a lot of people get down on hunting, right? As, oh, it's a terrible thing, you're killing these animals. But um, hunters by far do put the most money into habitat, wildlife conservation compared to anybody else, any other uh, person, unless you're making like huge donations. So, and the, re the way they do that, uh, even if you're a hunter, you might not even r realize this, but there's a federal tax on all ammunition that you buy, fishing licenses, uh, not fishing licenses, but um, fishing tackle, there's like a 5% tax on that. And that generates in the U.S. about $200 million um, annually. And those $200 million every year are uh, used to buy, buy land for national wildlife refuges or um, hunting areas. So um, now a good portion of this land that is bought is and and used to manage that land it's not just all buying land um a good portion of that land then they allow hunters on there so if you're anti-hunting i understand that you know okay you might not really care that this excise tax is helping hunters get more land to hunt on but um you know as far as actually allowing these animals to be around and have habitat, this is probably the biggest uh, funding source for this that that has you know each year and you know every year essentially. Uh, another example of this is the federal duck stamp. So basically, if you um, want to go duck hunting or goose hunting, you need to buy a duck stamp. It's uh, I think about fifteen or twenty dollars. Um, and that has purchased a lot of five, over 500 million acres of habitat for uh, waterfowl refuges where you actually can't hunt. But, um, you know, the more refuges we have, then those ducks that are using those will eventually spill out into other areas. And um, that's kind of the, the thinking behind that. So when we move away from conservation and into like environmental development, this is that idea that is this anthropocentric. So like everything revolves around the human. So if we think of, you know, New York City here where there is no natural habitat here, right? It's all skyscrapers here. It's all residential areas. Um, it's basically taking the land and all of the organisms are used for humans. Um, all of the resources are used for humans. And a lot of people are like, you know, somewhat thinking that not all land should be done used this way, right? Um, we'll, at, at later times throughout this, this class, we'll talk about cities of whether they're actually good for the environment or bad for the environment. But um, I think it's, it's really important to think about um, how much of this land do we want to just completely develop? So, and I think a lot of people say, well, environmental development, oh yeah, yeah, we, that, we don't want to do that. That's, it's, it's not a popular idea, but essentially it's pretty much the practice, right? So, um, you know, example of this is, is a wheat field completely developed? And the answer is, well, maybe, right? Um, certainly there's some wild animals in that wheat field, but realistically, you know, the entire wheat, that the entire wheat field is pretty much all for human use. And what we see is, even though we have like a, an Endangered Species Act, so this here is the lesser prairie chicken, and it's um, an, uh, threatened and endangered in certain places, and um, a lot of states, particularly with this one, um, w w what this lesser prairie chicken needs is a big areas of short grass prairie, so um, it requires a lot of land for these these chickens to be able to be around, and um, a lot of states are suing the federal government so to allow them to take some short uh, short grass prairie, this lesser prairie chicken habitat, and to use for um, use for developing. And we kind of just see this over and over and over again. The, the government makes exceptions and allows people to do things, and then they have to step back later and say, oh, well, this, this didn't um, 
uh, that this habitat was taken away. We need to restrain development. And we see, so um, environmental development is pretty much really the reality of how we use our land. But um, I think a lot of people say, um, no, that's not what we want to do, at least not with all of our land. The thing is, we need to be really careful with this idea because um, it's really easy for us here in America, sitting on you know our couch, watching on our big screen TV you know, some nature documentary on the Discovery Channel or you know Planet Planet Earth um, nature documentaries, right? Um, and we can say that oh, the rainforests are being cut down. We really need to stop that, right? Um, and what we see is kind of across the developed world, a lot of people are saying, hey, you know, you people that live in the rainforest, you can't develop your land. You can't build cities. You can't cut down the forest. And those people are, think, imagine if you are living in this this house here right if you're uh fishing for your living on this river here um a lot of people in these like in these kind of situations in developing worlds don't have savings don't have um you know a plan to how to save their rainforest that they live in they probably are worrying about what to eat tomorrow right they, do they have enough food for tomorrow if I don't catch a fish if I don't go into the rainforest and shoot something to eat my family won't have food so I think it's you know it's really easy for us to say don't cut down your rainforest whereas the people that are actually living there are like if I don't cut down my rainforest I will not feed my family this year tomorrow next month you know like um, so what we see is the short-term gains are oftentimes win out in this scenario. And I think it's really hard to argue with that point that, um, you know, those people living, the people living here probably, I, I, you know, if that's the only way that they can get food, I, who am I to say that they, they can't do that? So I think it's really important to, you know, think about not all environmental development is bad and there are certainly times where where it, it's okay to do that. So kind of a balance then between um, maybe preservation and uh, environmental development, like complete development, is this idea of sustainable development. And, you know, this idea is it's the balance of meeting our own needs without jeopardizing future generations' ability to do the same. So this, this sustainable development idea, I think, is really poorly defined. Um, so, you know, it can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different areas, depending on what habitat we're talking about, what biome, what country, what continent, whatever. Um, but basically, there's like four kind of main pillars to this, this, this idea that um, when people are using their land, they need to think about, okay, how does it help the people? How does it help the environment? How does it help our economy? And how does it help the cultural practices of the people? And so um, an example of this is uh, shade-grown coffee, right? So there's kind of like two different ways to grow coffee. Coffee is generally grown, you know, in the tropics. Um, and so let's say southern Mexico, right? Um, people can, one of the ways to do it is just to cut down all the trees and start a coffee plantation where you plant a bunch of coffee trees. And this has the highest productivity uh, for coffee, right? Like, because there's no other trees that are soaking up that sunlight, um, those coffee trees can produce a lot of coffee. But what you lose then, that coffee then, all, all the only thing you get out of that plot of land is coffee. But if you shade grow your coffee, so what they do is they leave the big trees and then uh, some small trees that will grow into big trees later, but then plant coffee trees underneath those, um, those big trees. So what you get 
is, you know, before if you only have coffee trees, you're losing everything else about the environment. The economy is completely dependent on um, on that coffee. But shade grown coffee, you um, you get some some environmental uh, in benefits, I should say. Um, you know, you'll still have monkeys up in those tre those big trees. You, but you'll still be growing coffee below them. So you'll have a lot of organisms that can still use that habitat. And yes, it's a little bit human modified, but there's still a lot of environmental benefits for that. Um, the economy then. So um, there's yes, there's fruits or co coffee. Uh, beans that you can get from that that land but then there's also fruit trees that are growing in that land there's also potentially animals that they can hunt um, so it's it's more of a like a diversified portfolio I sh you can make an analogy of that in this sense um, and then it also preserves the the cultural um, the the culture of the people because you know these people in southern Mexico that are growing coffee a lot of their culture revolves around growing coffee. So they're still growing coffee, maybe in a different way, but it preserves a lot of their culture. And when you put all four, three of these things together, then you come back to the social thing of it's helping the people much better. Um, so, so this is an example of this sustainable development idea. Um, again, this can, you, know, you obviously cannot apply, apply the same things of as shade grown coffee to a different habitat that you know doesn't have coffee or you know, an aquatic habitat or something but um, there's there's all sorts of different ways to do this and I think a lot of people just need to be aware that you know there might be a different way to grow certain crops in certain areas that um, have more benefit more holistic benefits all right that's it for this lecture and uh, we'll see you later